My name is Armagan Alhaq. I'm the manager of program development and partnerships at the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy at University of Waterloo. And I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today, uh, Mr. Chandra Ramadurai, who is the CEO of Efficiency Capital, EC. It is a Canadian energy efficiency investment company offering innovative investment in retrofits for residential, commercial, industrial, and institutional buildings. Ramadurai brings over two decades of experience in general management, strategy, merger and acquisition M&A, and banking across industries and geographies, including Canada, the US, the Middle East, India, and Europe. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mr. Chandra Ramadurai. Good morning. Can you all hear me in the back? Out there? Okay. Great. Um, so I guess um, uh, thank you for having me here. I was, when I came here, I wasn't sure what, what was the type of audience I was going to be uh, getting, whether it was going to be more engineers out here, more business people, a combination of people, and so on and so forth. Um, so I did get some background. I know there is a lot of, a lot of engineering minds out here, and trust me, I, I, I tried to become an engineer at some point in time. I'm no longer an engineer, not by practice. Uh, but uh, one of the problems I did realize in my journey as a corporate uh, uh, over the last 25 years, I started my career in the, the banking financial services space, um, and then I moved into, did a lot of investing. And uh, so one of the companies we had invested into was an engineering company. Um, and this engineering company is, uh, like a strong pedigree, a lot of renewable, sustainable energy type development. Um, and then eventually, I, when I went to run this company, I realized that all the people working in the company were engineers, and I was the finance guy, and they were all trying to talk to me, and I just couldn't understand half the things of what they said, or they couldn't understand what I said, right? So it, it was a very interesting challenge for me. We tried to basically figure out, um, uh, like, you know, so I, 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 let's say now I am in the very fortunate position that I can talk the geek language to the engineers, and I can talk the financial language to the bankers. Uh, so the, why I'm giving you this background is, today, uh, as part of the journey, one of the things I realized is um, there's a lot of good work which is already out there in the market, and in the, and in the overall, uh, this thing in terms of the energy space. But a lot of the adoption has not been happening, and that's because the, the technology does not necessarily match market mechanisms to move things forward. Um, I, over the last five, six years, I've been very uh, involved in the adoption of these market mechanisms, uh, both in Canada and abroad. Uh, and I've been, uh, and part of, the, today I'm just going to share a part of the journey with you all. Uh, and I'm going to basically sort of talk a little bit. Some of these, I'm going to sort of do some stage setting, uh, give some uh, background. And then we'll basically dive into some of the new things which we're trying to develop, some things which could basically change how things are happening. That's where we are at this point in time. Uh, but before I start, I'm going to, do you want to, is there a mechanism to turn off these lights? Yes. The, uh, huh? uh, you need it for the recording? Well, yeah, sure. So it's okay. If at all he needs it better. I mean, if, if people can see it, I'm okay with it. Um, so one of the things I'm looking for uh, is I'm going to start with some questions. I'm, when I said I'm coming to an university, I said I'm not going to pass on this opportunity. I have to start asking questions, right? And um, we, I'm going to ask you two questions. And I'm saying this up front. Uh, don't look to Google. I know there are, very fa there are many fast fingers around here, because, uh, not because you can't basically uh, be fast enough to respond to this, uh, but because you won't get the answers, because I've already tried that, OK? But I'm going to ask you this first question. What is the energy spend in Canada? Anyone out there? And I'm talking including all energy spend, including transportation energy spend. So hi. Any, anyone out there? Can I, anyone can give a range, if nothing else? I was thinking that if someone can answer these two questions, we definitely want to talk to you, because we, don't, we, want, we want to work with you as an organization, <laughs> right? <laughs> but uh, because we've been struggling there or through this, but I know that I'm coming to a place where there's a lot of information, knowledge. Uh, so Chandra, I would say give them a range. And you guys okay. They might be able 
Now, I'm not talking gigajoules. I'm talking dollar spent as opposed to consumption spent. Because you will find uh, consumption, I mean, energy uh, intensity numbers and stuff like that are gigajoule numbers. Let's talk about it. Let's say I'll give you three options. Um, 10 to $50 billion, 50 to $100 billion, and 100 to $150 billion. I'm talking Canada, annual spend. So how about 150 to 500 option? So if I give you a fourth option. Now I'm just trying to confuse you. No, it is your, <laughs> you're right. It's, it's the 100 to 150 option, OK? So now I'm going to ask you a more pertinent question. Does anyone know what is the spend of energy efficiency in dollar terms in Canada? A billion? OK. Anyone else out there? I will be talking about it later on. But I just wanted to sort of sit, try to find out how much uh, uh, this thing. Because uh, you guys, are, you, you're, not, you're not far away. But um, uh, you, you, 10. 10. Uh, so the number is somewhere in between. Uh, uh, but we will talk about uh, 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 what the number should be versus what it is. OK, eventually, as we, as we get into it. So but with, uh, without further ado, let's, let me just quickly run you through what we are trying to do today. I'm going to give a quick overview of the market. OK, and the overview is basically talking about the global picture, the Canadian picture, both in terms of uh, energy as well as uh, GNG, uh, this thing, emissions. OK, and how there is a correlation between these two. That's one part. The second thing we talk about is some, what are the barriers? Um, I, when I first looked into it uh, at about 10 years ago, when I started getting into this space, uh, I was like, wow, this is like a huge opportunity. Why is nothing happening? I see a lot of barriers. Let's talk about it. Okay? And that is, I, I, how many of you in this uh, room is, are familiar with EPC, Energy Performance Contracting? OK. So I guess, uh, I, I, so it's, I was very hesitant to put that information out there because I thought there will be a lot more people. So it's good, good I put that background there. And uh, I'll talk about what we call an ESPA. ESPA is a, is a trademarked uh, product, uh, which is basically developed by what you would call uh, uh, the, the Atmospheric Fund, TAF, which is a City of Toronto organization. We'll talk about that. And finally, we'll gi I'll give you a couple of case studies. Um, and uh, then we'll have some time for questions. So this is the total global energy investment, if you look at it, is approximately $1.7 trillion. This was the number as of 2016. Okay, um, and this is U.S. dollars as opposed to Canadian. Okay, almost two trillion plus in uh, Canadian dollar terms. Of this, about 14 percent goes to energy efficiency, about 221 billion dollars. Okay, which um, you could argue is a decent thing, but uh, there have been a lot of attempted studies, at it, but it is very geography specific, so it's very difficult to generalize. But on a rough basis. If you were to spend a billion dollars in energy production investment, uh, you would probably spend between 20 to 30 percent in equivalent energy investment. This thing avoided. You call it as megawatts or gigawatts uh, or versus megawatts. Megawatts meaning negative watts, right? So, so the, so the cost of producing uh, one megawatt equivalent of uh, rather equivalent of megawatts is a lot lower, okay? And talking of the $221 billion investment, uh, we have about a, a large portion of this goes to buildings. And when I say this is energy efficiency investment, this is not the actual number. That, this is what we would call the incremental investment. So if you are to basically go and do an energy retrofit in a building, let's say, and it costs you a million dollars, but you want to put in a more energy efficient equipment. And because of it, your project cost has gone from 1 to $1.3 million. 300,000 is the incremental investment. So this 221 is actually the incremental number. It's not the full, uh, uh, the actual number. The actual number is much more than 700 billion. Okay? So this, is the, this represents pure efficiency, so to that extent. But why I'm bringing that up is, while buildings is a large component of it, uh, transportation is also a very significant number out there. Again, transportation is probably has a very high, it's almost cost 30% of GAG 
Um, uh, but we'll talk about it, uh, this thing, right? Um, uh, the, of, in the building piece, you have a large portion, more almost 50% of the investments going into the building goes into what you would call envelope retrofits. Envelopes are basically the external, the, the, the glasses and the facade work, a lot of those types of a thing. And typically, they end up paying very expensive and very long um, uh, payback periods. Okay. And so I, I'm drilling down. I'm just trying to go down the funnel out here. Okay. Uh, so the 118 billion building investment, and the reason why buildings is because that's the one we are trying to focus on. That's the one we are trying, which we believe has a very significant potential to reduce greenhouse gases in the short term. So that's one of the reasons. Uh, because a yeah, lot of what can be done in the building space, the technology is out there. In the transportation and industry space, uh, the technology is not yet out there. So we're talking about adoption out here. Uh, so of the 118 billion, if you were to look at a global split, you have yet 24% of the investments are happening in the US, and almost 20% in China. Canada does about 2% of the global investments. Okay, and the reason why I'm saying that is that you look at the table to the right out here, uh, probably a little bit further down, Germany has the same amount of energy consumption as Canada, almost. They spend 15, per, they, they do 15% of the total investment globally into efficiency. Canada, on an equivalent basis, only does 2%. So which is a little bit of a surprise. You would think that Canada is up there in, in terms of other developed economies that you would think that we are, uh, we are right up there. But it tells you a very different story. Questions at the end, or can I ask one now? If, uh, Is there clarification on the table? Or? Yeah, sure, please go ahead. So, sorry to interrupt, just to clarify on that table. So, Germany has the same energy consumption as Canada for buildings or total? This is the, 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 the no, this, this is the overall energy consumption. We are comparing the overall energy consumption because we don't have building breakouts. So what we are assuming that the split between transportation um, uh, and industry and this thing is reasonably similar. So this is all, including all mobile fuels, natural gas, and electricity? Yes. So I also want to talk about what you would talk about the market size, right? Uh, we, so we have, a, this is the total market size when it comes to uh, what you would call, this is the ESCO market size, right? right? So uh, you'll eventually get to what is ESCOs, but one of the basic things which, where there's a lot of measurement happening in the market at this point in time is basically uh, how much of investment is happening in a performance contract mechanism, performance contracting mode, okay? Today, if you look at it, the US and China have been growing substantially, while well, Canada has been reasonably flat, or it's been, in fact, going down. Uh, so, in the, generally, Canada is basically measured as one-tenth of the US, as a, as a rule of thumb. But out here, it's actually been just going the reverse direction, and that's a cause for concern for us, partly. Now I'll talk about GHGs, okay. With the, ex the emerging economies, obviously they are increasing their emissions. Their emission intensity has been decreasing, but the economic activity is increasing due to that the, the overall emissions have been increasing, okay. Uh, even in Canada, the emission intensity has been decreasing, uh, and, and also the energy intensity has been decreasing simultaneously. But one of the basic things, if you look at it here is, if you look at European Union or United States, there has been a downward trend in terms of GHG emissions over the last 10 years. Canada has agreed that we will reduce 30, per, uh, um, from, from the baseline of 2005, we'll reduce 30% of our GHG emissions by 2030. That's the goal we have set for ourselves. That's what we've committed in, in, in the COP, uh, which is basically the, the, the climate uh, forum. Um, uh, so, but, Till 2015, pretty much we are reasonably on par. There's, the reduction is very nominal, okay? And this, you would see, amplifies the problem. 
we are, by 2030, we are supposed to be at 523 million tons of emissions. We are currently at 722. I mean, this is 2015 numbers. Uh, uh, but uh, from there on, the trend projected by the government, if at all there had been no, there's no activity happening, it would probably be at 742. Okay, we are going up rather than going down. So there is going to be a lot of work which needs to be done. And one of the places which has identified, uh, like you know, IEA is the International Energy Agency, and IEA has basically said that uh, the uh, energy efficiency can reduce almost 50% of the overall emissions, the of the targeted emissions. So, so you can see why energy efficiency is becoming important in the overall scheme of things. Okay. So, that's, so that's to give you a sort of this thing. And then I asked you the question about the size of the energy market. Okay. Um, so we have estimated that number. Uh, the, the, this is the efficiency market. Sorry, this is not the energy market, the efficiency market. This is the second question, right? Uh, there, there's a range. If you look at the, the right circle out there, uh, what you would call as the potential market is anywhere between 15 and $50 billion. This is based on certain estimates of energy consumption. This is based on a lot of uh, uh, like, you know, assumptions in terms of can we save 1% every year or 2% every year? from the baseline, or can we save 10%? So depending on what you're thinking about it, but yeah, a 1% to 2% reduction you would think is the absolute minimum given. At a 2% reduction, you would need at least a $15 billion investment year after year after year in Canada, okay, um, to basically achieve 2% reductions, minimum. Okay, and, uh, but the actual investment which, you happen, uh, which is happening, again, these numbers are not very easily available out there. It's very, very difficult to guess, uh, estimate, and we have, uh, it's taken a lot of work. Um, I'm, we have a great team out here in Efficiency Capital. Uh, in fact, so the first hire we had is from University of Waterloo, so Nadia is sitting here. Um, and uh, so uh, the reason I'm saying that is we estimated the number to be roughly around $5 billion is the actual investment happening. That number could be four, it could basically be six, but, uh, but it's broadly in that range, let's put it that way. Uh, and of the $5 billion, you would talk about uh, the guarantee uh, co contracts, which is basically a savings guarantee, which we'll talk about eventually. It's a very, very small portion. Uh, it's about $300 million at this point in time versus about 4.7 otherwise. And uh, th these are Canadian dollars, just to clarify. Okay? And of the $5 billion market, more than 50% is buildings. Again, the, to the topic which you are attacking. Actually, this is 2015 numbers. In 2016, the number of building was almost 58%. Okay. This is what the government tells we have been doing. Okay. Uh, according to the government, we have, and they have, there has been a lot of work which has happened. I don't want to minimize the amount of work which has happened. I'm just more worried about what hasn't happened rather than what has happened. But what has happened is this. We have reduced almost 50 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions by undertaking energy efficiency activity. If we hadn't under undertaken efficiency activity, the emission levels would have been 50 million tons more than the 722. Okay, so that's so that's that's the impact. Okay, and this is the the breakup is between residential, commercial, and uh, in industrial. Okay, and there's almost 20 billion dollars in avoided costs. That's been there is an energy efficiency savings in dollar terms of $20 billion in, between 1990 and 2013. Okay. So this is to give you a sense of how much impact it can add to the value, uh, to the economy. So I, the, I, so I just, I think um, I have given you some overview. I do not know it's too many, too much of data, too little data, but uh, I, I guess it will set the stage for what we are trying to talk about, right? So. One side, I see this whole thing, as, as I said, like, you know, I see a huge opportunity. We are talking about an annual $5 billion investment and a $10 billion, what I would call, yeah, unmet need. You, if you look at the buildings cry around us, right? I mean, I was just driving through Waterloo this morning, coming in here, and I saw so many buildings in need of retrofits, renovations, newer equipment, um, boilers, like, you know, air conditioning, all, all of these, right? And none of those are happening around here. Not just here, any, all around, okay? So why is that not happening? 
it's it's not because of lack of money. You would think that it is because of lack of money, partly, right? But are, but it, there are a lot of other reasons to it. So, and this is what we'll talk about, right? So, one of the basic things we realized is the general building owner, be it in the industrial segment, the commercial, the commercially savvy REITs, or the average homeowner who is basically owning a condo in a building, uh, they just don't care about energy. For them, energy is too complex, too much not in the scheme of things. Um, so people just don't want to do any investments. They just, I mean, if tomorrow the boiler is breaking down, they have to replace it because otherwise you won't get hot water, right? Uh, but other than that, they just don't want to do anything. And that's part of the problem, okay? Um, so most of the investment is reactionary. And, uh, but if you look around, most of the investments we make don't commercially make sense. For example, renewable energy. Uh, it's become big. I'm very happy. I, I, I come from the renewable energy world and I moved to the efficiency world. Okay? Uh, but uh, one of the things I see in renewable energy is renewable energy gives good return to investors today because of governmental incentives. Only in the last two, three years, there has basically been uh, a reduction in cost and it still is not in many cases at grid parity. Uh, and until eventually, I wanted to become uh, renewables could become mainstream, especially when combined with storage. That's but that's a conversation for another day, right? Uh, but uh, efficiency, contrarily, not today, for the last 15, 20, 30 years, has been economically viable, meaning that we did not need any governmental subsidies. We need action plus we need the government to incentivize us to basically do things but once you invest the money you don't need the government to give you any doles out there to basically make your economic return work and that's what really bothers me that like you know when you're easily get 15 20 percent most of the projects i have in the past done like in uk in india and a bunch of places uh, we've done a lot of 30 percent plus projects and 30 percent irr private equities will bloody die to give away their money okay um so but unfortunately, no money is flowing into the space. So this is one of the, so we're, we're trying to find out what's the problem, right? And the reality is that people always say, you are in, we are in the university, right? They, we always say, you have to know the problem to find the solution. Unfortunately, there's not enough attempt even to find uh, this thing. We have generic North American studies, but the last real study we are aware of, which has really been done, has been almost seven, eight, 10 years old. So this is a slightly older study, but I would basically say one of the basic things which comes about is capital availability. When I say, when I say capital availability, it's not necessarily uh, lack of money, but it's lack of allocation of, uh, like you know, there are competing priorities for the capital all along. And those are all some of the issues we are talking about. Return, which probably comes as, as, as a component of risk and, and the, uh, the dedicated attention. People just don't want to basically, they don't have time to attend to this. Okay, so these are all some of the problems they are dealing with. So, if you, if you look at the top, this thing, almost 75, 80% of it is broadly um, return, money, money, money related stuff or risk or lack of attention. This is also confirmed by one another study. This, that, is more, this, that was a quantitative study and this is more a qualitative study. TAF, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Uh, TAF is the uh, atmospheric fund, uh, which we mentioned before. They did a study when, uh, when this entire, uh, they were trying to incentivize people to invest into the energy efficiency space. They were trying to make buildings, put more money into the space. And they did a, a study and one of the, the three top things they identified was capital, risk, and inertia. Okay, this is the exact um, uh, thing which was also confirmed in the previous slide. But we come back to the same thing, right? So you have to, unless you overcome these three big problems, um, money, uh, the ability to take the, manage the risk, and making it easy for the people out there, you're not really going to be successful. That's, so that's the genesis of what you would call a, a performance contracting solution, right? So now, I don't know if you have any questions, but probably we just keep going and do the questions at the end, right? Um, so we talk about uh, any solution out there which we are doing uh, to basically make this work, as we said, because of the problems we have seen, one, it has to be uh, easy and simple. Um, the second big problem is availability of professionals. When I say availability of professionals, I'm not talking about just at an industry level, I'm talking at a local level. So if you're doing, you're building retrofit in Waterloo, we need to have 
people who are basically going to one, do all the work, and then continuously monitor, maintain, and do this for the next 20, 30 years. So uh, think about a lot of places, uh, smaller towns like Thunder Bay are out there. Do we really have qualified people who, is there an industry out there for someone to have a living there, right? Maybe not. So those are some of the problems we have to attack as we go through this. Uh, the other one is a combination of uh, financing and incentives. The, especially in Ontario right now, uh, we have this Green On program. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. Green On is basically the, the carbon tax dollars, which is basically being administered by this Green Ontario Fund, which, uh, like, you know, they have a huge $700 million plus money out there, and they are figuring out how to spend this money. So today, if you look, talk to a lot of the market participants, people are in wait mode. Oh, I'm going to get some money from these guys. They are going to give me free thermostats at home, right? So we are not going to do any stuff. Uh, so there's been a lot of inertia. Like, you know, so one of the things we have to do is any, any program we put in place has to basically take into account incentives which are coming in place so that it reduces the cost of the project and then factors in a financing combination. Right? It has to have good quality and assurance. It obviously, the, the more projects you do, you, better, uh, you, you get better at it. Um, and there's got to be a track record of project success. And finally, it has to de-risk the investments. That's the risk piece we are talking about. Like, you know, so one of the things which really came about to basically uh, do a lot of these is what you would call the methodology called energy performance contracting, okay? and the EP, or EPC for short. The EPC, which most other people would use, is engineering, procurement, and construction. That's not the same EPC here. Okay? Um, so to, in short, what is EPC? Okay, it's, um, these are generally used for comprehensive building upgrades. If you just want to go and switch out all your lights with LEDs, you don't necessarily need an EPC guy who would basically come and uh, do a lot of these. You could just call uh, your electrician and he would come and do a lot of this work, okay? Um, the second piece, important component is there will be a guarantee about the savings. So you're saying you're investing a million dollars, you're saying $200,000 is going to be the savings the $200,000 savings has to happen, and there has to be a mechanism to do that, right? That's the second piece. Uh, and third piece is basically, typically these have, are, are offered by what you would call ESCOs. ESCOs are energy service companies. We'll talk a little bit more about them uh, a little bit later. Um, um, and uh, the other part is the technical solution has to be combined with the financial solution. And the financial solution, uh, because uh, it, a building owner typically does not know how to go and up, talk to a bank, explain the technology, and explain how the savings are going to happen. And many a time, that conversation is a non-starter. So it, these guys would basically facilitate the overall piece. So that's typically energy performance contracting. From a history, historical context, and uh, I, I said, like, you know, now that I, this is my chance to talk about history, do all the work of uh, finding out what the hell happened, right? So, uh, so we did this um, uh, thing. Okay. ESCOs really actually started back in the 70s and early 80s, primarily as a result of a lot of the, the first Iran oil crisis, when oil prices started shooting up, availability and um, price of oil was a, this thing. That's when efficiency really started coming into focus. Okay, so uh, in uh, uh, Canada, 1981, it's one of the earliest adopters of the ESCO model. Uh, there was a company, a Quebec company called Econoller. Uh, it was actually an offshoot of Hydro-Quebec, uh, which basically pioneered this concept out here in Canada. Okay. And then it started taking roots in a, in a big way. Uh, then some of the governments, both in Canada and the US, started mandating that you start using a performance contracting mechanism. They found it to be a very easy mechanism to mitigate the risk and also take care of a lot of the budget reallocation issues. And, uh, Given that background, they basically started mandating, so it started really picking up space. Uh, but well, as I said, one of the integral pieces of this is measurement. So when you say measurement, you say, I'm saving something. What are you saving? Your savings against what you're spending today. So a baseline measurement is a very, very important thing. And I might say something as a baseline, you might may say something, and someone else might say something else. And there could be a lot of disputes in these situations. Uh, so one of the things which people said is like, you know, let's come up with a, a standardized protocol. That led to what you would call the IPMVP. That's the International Performance Measurement and Verification uh, Protocol. Uh, it basically standardizes how you would measure baselines, how you would measure savings, how would you adjust for climate 
So if this, this, the, this winter is more harsh than the previous one, or there is less occupancy in this building this year compared to the last year, so on and so forth. You need to adjust for all of those. So that, that's, that, that protocol provides the standard. Okay? Um, and then there was a lot of fast growth, especially in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then a bunch of things happened in early, uh, around 2002, Enron collapsed. Um, there was uh, a hiatus in the US. U US has primarily been in the forefront, a lot of driving a lot of these adoption mechanisms. Uh, so there was a one year hiatus. Uh, the, the program, which was, was not renewed for a period of a year because there was a lot of concern about a lot of the, what you would call synthetic financial structures. And uh, so that, that reduced that whole thing. But then uh, it picked back up. There has been a lot of growth, except in Canada. Uh, there's been a lot of growth of the ESCO, uh, the performance contracting market. So talking of ESCOs, okay, and um, again, it, 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 it's been, uh, actually it's been a very fascinating journey. I know, I know that uh, like, you know, we've all seen China evolve in front of our eyes in the last 10 years, uh, and this is another case. 2006, China was a $100 million market. Okay. Today, we are talking about a 15 plus billion dollar market, and this is 2015, and I think, uh, uh, clearly this is 2016, 15, 15 was to 13 billion dollars, right? Um, uh, so it's, it's a lot of um, it, the, uh, how they leapfrogged established markets, established business models, partly driven by policies, partly driven by incentives and a bunch of things, but it's amazing how they have done. Um, so this is broadly the thing, and um, uh, you'd notice that uh, Canada says 0.2 here and it's at 0.3 before. I know that will be a disconnect, but that's, ma that's mainly because we converted into US dollars out here. That it was Canadian dollars. So just to clarify. Um, uh, and if you look at it, again, I'm setting the stage for something here, is the institutional segment, um, is, uh, which you would call the the, the federal government and the MUSH segment, the municipalities, uh, universities, schools, and hospitals, uh, they do most of these performance contracting because they have a public procurement. They're answerable to a bunch of things. Uh, so typically, a lot of mandated federal, federally mandated uh, programs typically get started there, uh, both in US and in Canada. That segment typically accounts for more than 90% of the total investments happening in the performance contracting market today. Why is this relevant, right? If you would look at the next slide, you would realize that uh, over 50% of the emissions come from the residential and the industrial segment. And if you include the commercial, which is like, you know, probably it's like 55% or whatever it is of the emissions. But hardly any energy efficiency is happening there, less than 10%. And this is one of the things which needs to change for this to really happen. And that's, that's, that's the dilemma we are faced with. Uh, the, other, uh, the, other, uh, the other thing here is that uh, part of the reason why institutional uh, investments happen a lot more is because you trust the creditworthiness of the federal government or a university or a, or a local municipality more than you trust uh, XYZ plastics, which, is, which may or may not be in business in five years when you're doing a 10-year contract term with them. Right? And these are all some of the, the risks of doing business in that segment. So um, again, uh, ESCOs, right? Uh, one of the basic uh, 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 problems with uh, uh, this thing is that there are two, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but I would say there are approaches. There are two main approaches which has basically been pioneered in this uh, space. One is what you would call a shared savings model. Another is what you would call a guaranteed savings model. Both of them give you guarantees because that's an essential uh, component of performance contracting. But one major, basic difference is the financial risk. Yeah, what you would, so the shared savings, if you were to do performance contracting using a shared savings model, you would also take the performance risk. Meaning that if, so, the, so I, 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 I think the next slide is probably going to this thing, right? And, um, but I, I, I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a minute. But before that, uh, ESCOs. One of the basic characteristics in Canada is that ESCOs never deploy capital. They do the, the technical and the work and they guarantee the savings, but they will never basically de deploy the money. Okay? The shared savings model is not really in vogue. And the other thing here is there's a huge concentration. People say there's a lot of competition, but at the same time, there's a lot of 
uh, I, I see it as a concentration. If you look at it, there are only eight ESCOs. In fact, actually there are five or six of them who basically own 95% plus of the market. And almost all of them are equipment manufacturers. So they have to sell a product, so that's the reason they go with the performance contracting thing. So a lot of those situations happen. Uh, but uh, I, I'm going to get into what uh, the, I, I told you about uh, how, the, how to mitigate the risk of performance uh, 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 this thing. But uh, further, I'm going to get to ESPA. ESPA is the Energy Savings Performance Agreement, um, which is a, a concept which has been pioneered by TAF. Uh, TAF is basically a, a, a quasi-governmental agency. It was created back in 1991 when Canada went to the Global Forum to Kyoto uh, and basically committed to save a bunch of greenhouse, uh, to reduce a bunch of greenhouse gases. So uh, all these mandates were passed down to the various province, uh, provinces and the city level. And Toronto was basically tasked with a huge reduction target. So they ended up creating what they would call the Toronto Atmospheric Fund at that point in time. Uh, it was, they got a grant from the city of Toronto and they said, you further activities that would reduce greenhouse gases uh, or invest in technologies or businesses that would further greenhouse gases. That was the mandate. So they were given a corpus of money. Um, and uh, they did that for, they did a bunch of stuff uh, for the first 15, 20 years. But about 10 years ago, they said uh, a lot of the low hanging fruits, uh, the first low hanging fruit, there actually, if you look at uh, the historical context, there are two major uh, drivers of greenhouse gas emissions, primarily in Ontario. One was generation. This is 25 years ago I'm talking, energy generation. Uh, around 2008, 2009, a lot of the impetus had passed away because uh, all of them had or, or were converting into, we were pretty much a green production area because all the coal plants and other things have been shut down at this point in time. Uh, so that's when the focus started shifting. So which is the second biggest driver, which is the existing stock of buildings. Um, so to give you a sense of statistics, by 2030, people are saying that 80% of the buildings would be uh, in existence then would basically be uh, buildings that are already built. Okay, so you're talking about a lot of old buildings out there in the market. Okay, um, so they basically said that how do we reduce uh, energy uh, consumption in these types of buildings? And for that, a lot of uh, newer equipment, uh, adoption of efficiency measures, and all of those had to happen. And I'm just watching my time. Uh, okay, <laughs> so and uh, so one of the things um, uh, they found out is basically they, so they tried to go out in the market, did a bunch of education. Uh, they, said, they said like you know there's, there's a lot of reasons why people should do, but when they went out in the market, they realized things were not happening they, as they thought it would be. So they said we have to do something different. That's when they created ESPA. Um, this, once ESPA started taking root, they basically said we needed to commercialize. And I want to talk a little bit about EC out here because EC efficiency capital, I mean, I call it EC for short, uh, is, uh, it is incubated by TAF. We are the guys who basically uh, were brought in primarily to take this ESPA program and this investment program uh, and uh, take it out into the general market. We are a social for-profit enterprise. We are a for-profit enterprise, but we have a very social bent of mind. So we are not like, at least we believe we don't, uh, uh, like, you know, we don't do anything which would harm the overall growth of the market. Uh, we currently have a pan-Canadian focus. Okay, uh, we are not restricted to Ontario or Toronto or any of those places. Okay. So this is what this is what I was trying to explain before. So the way the model works is follows. So let's, I, let's say I go to this building. Let's talk, take this building as an example. So we, what we would do is we'll say, we'll send one of our engineers and the engineer would come and say, okay, we'll look at our energy utility consumption. Utility meaning uh, electricity, uh, water, and gas. And we say that, okay, um, you have a X number of, cons like you know, let's say you're consuming um, $250,000 or say half a million dollars, right? Uh, in this building, so we can, our ener uh, engineer will come and ask us, okay, we can reduce our energy consumption, so we can save maybe $200,000 a year, okay? And this is based on certain volume savings and certain as assumed prices. But to save these 200000 you would need to make an investment of a million dollars. 
uh, and most of the time, I come to the university, the university has a capital budgeting process, they would basically say, sorry, I don't have the money to allocate this year, we'll do it next year or the year after, uh, and till almost there is a crying need for a re replacement. And most of the time, there will be a one measure uh, change. So what we would say in these cases is, um, okay, Waterloo, we, will, we don't want you to put the money, we will come and put the money, we will invest the $1 million. And uh, once we put the million dollars, Every year, we'll come and say, measure the savings. You don't pay me anything unless we achieve those savings. So if at all I say we, we achieve 200000 we will say that we will take $150,000 of those savings. $50,000, we leave back with the university. Okay. So the university is getting a $50,000 cash flow for doing nothing other than basically letting us do this. Okay. Why are we doing this? Right. Um, it's partly to incentivize investments in these, uh, this thing. But uh, the other part of it is we want them to be bought in. There is a lot of, uh, like, you know, we are coming to uh, use that premises and a bunch of these things, right? So, so the, how this contract would work is, let's say we do this contract for eight or 10 years. So we take uh, uh, $150,000 in savings and, uh, for, the, for the contracted period. And at the end of the contracted period, we would just give away the equipment to the university for free. Uh, the equipment typically has a useful life of 25, 30 years in most cases. Okay, uh, there are many cases which run for 40 years, right? So the university has gone through an asset renewal process, asset upgrade process, without any cost. Okay, and uh, as, a, um, uh, uh, as an investment program, we have worked, okay? The, th that's one thing. The other thing which has, so when you look at something like this, there is a huge risk. One is dealing with an university, but the other one is dealing with, let's say, a private sector, industry. The industry, might, there is a huge risk in terms of this thing. There might be people who may not necessarily always have the intention. So there are two major risks. One is the technical performance risk. Could you really achieve these savings? Uh, could the baselines be agreed upon? A lot of those questions come into play. The second question is the credit risk. What if the business doesn't exist or does not want to pay after three years or five years? How do you basically deal with these, right? Uh, so you can't manage all risks. You, can, you, have, you have to manage risk, but you can't protect completely uh, this thing. But one of the, the good things I've seen, and I've, I've seen this um, model in, working in a lot of countries, but I think in Canada, we, uh, when I came here, I was very impressed by what I saw here, with the, especially with what TAF and Efficiency Capital was doing. Um, we have an insurance product. So the insurance company comes and verifies the savings. We say 200,000 savings is possible. The insurance company will come and say, yes, I verified it. I've sent my engineer, and the engineer confirms $200,000 savings are possible. So if anywhere during the next 10 years, uh, the contract period, the savings is 150000 the insurance company makes good the balance 50000 which is, I think, a very significant protection, which is not something which is out there in this thing. And like, you know, so I, I thought it was a very innovative thing. So that's, the, that, that's what this graph is trying to represent, what I was just trying to explain. Um, some of the key things, when you go to a building, we, we provide a one-stop solution. Uh, so the client basically, typically, uh, so one is a typical upgrade. They have to deal with the auditor, they will have to deal with the engineer, they will have to deal with the vendor, they will have to deal with the financing company. That's your standard methodology of doing with. Then you have the, what you would call an ESCO. The ESCO model typically involves you talking to two different people. Uh, one is... Uh, you, the ESCO might come and do integrate a lot of these. The one thing that they would not integrate is money. So you typically have still have to borrow money on your balance sheet. Uh, so uh, you would go and borrow money from a bank. And tomorrow, let's say, think about it as a Sears situation, right? You go, go and buy a washing machine uh, from Sears, with, and you've taken an extended warranty for five years, and you paid 500 bucks. At the end of the period, um, uh, like after two years, the washing machine has broken down. Sears is no longer there your $500 is gone. So the model we do is different. We basically go and say, we, uh, you, you, you still get the same $500 washing machine, but you don't pay $500 upfront. You pay $100 every year. So at the end of the second year, if the equipment is broken down and you can't reach us, then you don't need to pay us anymore. Right? So that's the basic. It's, so we're putting the customer in the front. Uh, that's the basic different uh, uh, this thing, right? Uh, the other thing is that we are not affiliated to any products or service providers. So if tomorrow we believe a Honeywell system is the best, 
uh, for a particular building, we would use that, or we want to use a Philips lighting, we would use that, or someone, someone else. We, we choose from a range of providers. Um, and the other, I think, one of the things which may, I don't know, it might not, may or may not interest this crowd is, it's not on the balance sheet. Typically, uh, a lot of the businesses have struggled to borrow money, partly because they have cap in terms of what they can borrow. So if they've borrowed for efficiency spent, they can't borrow for certain other core business activities. In this case, the equipment is owned by us, so we take all the risk, ownership risk. We borrow if we have to, right? Or we have our own capital to deploy. So that's the thing. And the other final piece I want to talk about is we work extensively with local talent. And this is one of the key characteristics I was telling you before, is uh, because we are not, uh, um, uh, we, uh, the engineers who are basically putting a lot of our program is a, typically a local engineer. Um, and uh, like, you know, he has to basically pass through certain approval mechanisms, but once they cross those, we, people can basically, uh, 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 like, you know, they, they can do that work. I'm going to quickly run through this in the interest of time, but typically, as I was just saying, that we are, we are a one-of-a-kind player in the market. Um, I'm sorry, I think there are some formatting issues when we play, play, play it out here, but, um, uh, but uh, this thing. So it typically in any performance contract, there's a financial risk, there's a technical risk, and the performance risk. As I said, uh, we, uh, in, in Canada, we are the only ones. In US, there are two or three other players who are trying to do what we are doing. Uh, and, uh, but this is, we take all of these risks. And the other thing which you would see is a lot of what you would call the in institutional initiatives, the mush segments, typically there's a, they're large size contracts. A lot of the existing players go after them primarily because of the size piece. And uh, in our case, uh, a lot of the investments are half a million dollars, one million dollars, as opposed to a five million, ten million dollar investment or a twenty-five million dollar investment. So we are typically aggregators. So we are like what you would call a energy efficiency developer, like a renewable energy developer. We are an efficiency developer. That's what we aggregate assets and we own those assets for a period of time. So that's just talking about this thing. And uh, we do is like you know, we are developers. We we own the asset and we manage the asset for the entire 10 year period. So we don't do it beyond the contract period, which is typically 10 years or less, generally in our case. Uh, but that's the broad thing. But we, so we work across the value chain. If generally the market in the past, you would find people who would develop, pass it on to someone else, and then some, a, a third person would do the management of the asset. And there is a lot of disconnect in, in the, which happens in those. Um, what, what we have done so far, uh, we have 11 clients. We've done this in about 40 buildings, including some of the contracts which are ongoing as we speak. Uh, we have 100% success. We have worked with uh, six YMCA facilities. We have worked with uh, Toronto Community Housing, which is uh, a city of Toronto-backed housing. I've been talking about the program, not just as including the TAF piece, uh, um, all of these. Um, uh, so we've worked with some uh, developers, community housing, and a bunch of these places. I'll quickly run through the case studies, and I'm not going to basically spend too much time, but I will just quickly there, if there are any questions, then we can answer those at that stage. I'm sorry, there has been a formatting issue probably. Maybe the PDF version was better in that case. I can see some of them moving to the next line. Uh, this is uh, like, you know, but uh, this was a, a cooperative housing society we did in the Toronto area. Uh, there's an investment, initial investment of about $740,000. Uh, it's, it's a 1992 vintage building, there's a lot of equipment that are reaching to the end of life. So we did a comprehensive retrofit. Um, we, we, made, we invested the money, took 90% of the savings, uh, very successful. The savings were more than, much more than predicted in a lot of those cases. Um, YMCA I mentioned, uh, smaller thing, single measure thing, we primarily did uh, investments in harmonizers. Harmonizers are primary, I, you guys probably know this better than me. Like, you know, but we are prim primarily voltage regulated and voltage, uh, like, you know, reduced energy con consumption through harmonizers. Uh, there's the, and, and every single time we measure how much carbon we save, we don't make investments in any uh, efficiency measure, like for, I call it a, a CHP, for example, the combined heat and power. Uh, there are measures in, in, uh, in Ontario, it's supposed to increase to GHG because we are substituting grid power, which is currently green, with uh, local power, which is gas-based. Gas so we don't invest into pure this thing. So our project will go ahead only if at all we have there's a GHG saving. Okay. And then I'm just going to quickly run through this. This is a, a project which we are currently doing. Um, I'm 
a billion dollar, a million dollar plus investment, uh, uh, variety of stuff uh, to being done, um, uh, like automation systems, LEDs, boilers, uh, VFDs, a bunch of these things, right? Water, incidentally, is a very, very huge uh, measure, uh, this thing. And uh, so one of the things we looked at is, uh, we, we also looked at it from a financial perspective for a lot of people is that, does it make sense for us to use our own money? So we said, like, what if at all they use their own money or if they went and borrowed versus what we did? Um, and obviously, there are many questions to be asked in these situations, right? What's the tax rate of the, of the, build, of, of the, uh, of the building owner? Um, do they have other uses of those capital? So we made certain assumptions. But broadly, one of the things which, which surprised even me when I first uh, saw this analysis was uh, I expected the return, rate of return, IRR, metric to be significantly better for, the, uh, like, you know, by, for using our capital. I expected the NPV to be slightly lower. It surprised me when the whole thing came out that even on an NPV basis for the building owner, uh, it's a lot better for them to, uh, to, to use yeah, performance-based mechanism. The biggest risk, the biggest thing we do in our case is we, uh, one is the usage of the capital we provide, but I think one of the biggest value we bring is not in the money piece, but the fact that these savings are actually happening. If you go, I, I mean, I, I'll give an example of a building I live in. We just went through a $2 million plus retrofit. Um, I was told that the equipment being put in is 65% more energy efficient than the previous one. And we expected a reduction in energy cost. But the projections given by the management committee uh, is uh, for the next three years, our costs are going up. So it just doesn't gel. So there are a lot of these issues happen. And that's where the whole problem comes, right? So. Uh, so this is what I would, uh, the, I just want to leave with this, and uh, this is, uh, we do have, uh, if you have any questions here, ob obviously you can ask now, but also there is also, um, uh, these are the contact details for it. So questions? I'm a problem. I can talk a lot about that. just regarding purposes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, Chandra. Thanks very much uh, for the presentation. Um, I'm thinking about your barriers. And I'm wondering if um, what your thoughts are with regards to, do you think it's a language issue? Do you think that the model works? Do you think that you're targeting the right area? And the reason I ask that question is if you look at actual energy consumption globally, industry consumes, well, the energy se sector consumes 50% of everything that the world produces. And of the remainder, manufacturing and industry consumes at least half. And if you think about the manufacturing sector, and if we want to focus on Ontario, a lot of people are targeting environmental controls, so air conditioning, lighting, um, sort of the standard stuff. Um, and when we talk, so I, I say language because we talk about a return on investment. And in manufacturing, to give a return on investment as a percentage would be is unacceptable. Return on investment is time. So if I, if I buy a new piece of equipment, I need to know the ROI is one year, two years max. So do you see people looking at things outside of just the building? I mean, an air conditioner consumes what, five kilowatts? A small machine tool consumes 50 kilowatts, and they have to run 24 hours a day. And in Ontario, well, Canada consumes 200 million megawatt hours, just electricity. We're not even talking gas. So I'm looking at the model and the language that's being used, and I'm wondering if one of the barriers, in your opinion, is actually a language issue. Sure. No, those are good points, uh, right? I'm, uh, the reason, uh, it could be the language issue, but I think it's a lot bigger. Um, industry is not a segment which is really uh, there, there have been a lot of self-investment because people see value in doing certain efficiency, but there has been no outside money which has been going into industry. Literally, there has been, uh, there's hardly been anything. Maybe it's a trickle which has been happening. Uh, so when, I, when you look at the building space, uh, there's one of the individual homes, okay? There is a different mechanism of adoption for these types of things, right? These are what you would call a retail adoption strategy. Uh, and and, and uh, that's not really the focus. Most of the governmental uh, initiatives and a lot of uh, what you would call 
uh, this private, semi-private initiatives like ours in combination with TAF um, is basically focused on the MERBs, which is the multi-unit residential buildings. Uh, and the reason why, in the MERBs, it's, the time doesn't matter. People do this because they have to do it. And in a, in a lot of cases, there's a crying need for doing this. So uh, I think it's more the fact that a lot of these people don't, uh, one, understand energy. That it's not their focus. So when you first go and talk to them, uh, oh, even this is possible? Uh, the, I mean, I'm not talking about the ESPA model. I'm talking about what you would call even the performance contracting model, right? Uh, they, so uh, and in the, when you talk about the ESPA model, Many a time there's disbelief. Uh, we have been out there in the market over the last, uh, I've, I've personally been doing this for the last year in Ken, uh, with efficiency capital out here. Um, and one of the basic things I'm finding here is that we've talked to a lot of uh, uh, community housing, like you know, for example, um, uh, the regional housing uh, uh, things, uh, conservation authorities, people who are trying to revitalize entry and neighborhood, uh, individual building owners, REITs. And one of the first things is, they don't even realize there is a new concept out there. And when they hear this for the first time, there's a, there's a disbelief. Oh, this sounds too good to be true. Uh, why, this happened to me in my own building. I went there after the decision has been made. But I'm just saying that the, these are some situations which, are, this, is our, this is our biggest barrier. I think that's the biggest thing. But because what we are trying to do is basically uh, reduce the complexity and for lack of a better word, dumb it down, right? I mean, we, we, want, we don't want the building owners to deal with the complexity, the energy, uh, uh, with the technicality of it. We just get an engineer, external engineer, which is verified external by, by a second time and a third time, and then we basically come and put the money. We manage the investment, so the client doesn't need to do anything, right? Uh, that's, that's the way we're trying to do it. Our hope is that this will get adopted more and more, because these are newer things, uh, to break into the market takes time. That's... Uh, more questions? Oh, there's one. Thanks, Andra. Uh, just a question regarding, uh, like, with your experience of the clients, there's probably also, from your side, uh, have to walk away from some of them because could likely the baseline might be difficult to set or uh, the operation, how does it work? Like you're still not operating the assets. Uh, you have to monitor, like your expenses will be very high if you try to control everything. How, how, how does that has been working with the case studies? Sure, the good question. Uh, we, we are currently in a situation where there is a, a, one of the, uh, someone has bought a, a large uh, uh, facility in Burlington and they are looking to repurpose that whole thing. So when you change, let's say, a commercial building to a residential building or a residential building, even within the commercial building from one purpose to another purpose, uh, the baseline doesn't work very well. There's going to be a problem in these situations. So there are two things which happen in those situations, uh, especially when in the early adoption phase. We want to basically do good to the maximum uh, number of uh, users rather than uh, random uh, samples, who, people who don't necessarily fit into what you would call the general mold. Uh, so uh, in those cases, we are, we are looking at two options. One is we either walk away, okay, because we don't really have the ability to do it. The second thing we have done is what uh, is called yeah, a deemed savings approach. A deemed savings approach is basically, uh, so you take an equipment and you basically, so the savings are a combination of two things. One is the equipment needs to perform better. Um, and, and number two, it also is dependent upon a lot of user control factors, um, like you know, occupancy, uh, uh, t t how temperature settings you use, all right? And uh, forget to not to mention climate and stuff like that. So if we can agree on a baseline, the, the client and us, then we say that that's the that becomes the baseline. From there on, we are basically there. So there are a lot of deemed. So we work on technical performance metrics. So we would say that the let's say the, the chiller was basically having a specific energy consumption of X, now we are going to improve it to 0.6 X. There's going to be a 40% savings. And as long as we can prove that the chiller is working at that particular 60% uh, efficiency compared to the previous baseline, we get paid. So that's one mechanism to do it. W 
we did a local survey on some barriers to energy conservation and efficiency in the industrial, commercial, and institutional sector. And one of the challenges they raised was the um, the burdensome process of applying to the different available incentives. So does efficiency capital do that for the clients? Do they make the applications so then? Yeah. So we would basically take complete responsibility because we own the equipment, though, even though uh, the uh, the building owner or the facility owner might be eligible for the incentives. The entire process is managed with the uh, utility by us and by our engineer. And you, and you had said earlier that uh, there's a time point where you hand over that asset ownership. Is that the same on, or is that a standard part of your process that there is a point where you just... Always, yourself? always. We never take back the equipment, ever. Okay, we abandon it, whether it's a two-year contract or a 10-year contract, we do that. So you're temporary asset owners. We're a temporary asset owner to protect our interests. In the yeah. Now, we are asset owners because if for some reason this becomes more relevant if tomorrow the equipment is, the, build, the building is basically getting sold off or uh, like, you know, getting abandoned and we are not getting paid our money, that's the time we would basically, it would become more relevant. But till then, it's just more uh, to take it off the balance sheet, let's put it that way. Can you just talk a little bit more about the water aspect? In the, one of the later slides, you said it's a big part, and I'm sort of specifically interested if you're measuring like the amount of water saved as part of the efficiency. Sure. Well, yeah, in, in, with respect to water, uh, typically a lot of the savings are happening because uh, there's a lot of leakage, old plumbing lines, a um, lot of uh, the, the older toilets and other things used to consume a lot more uh, wa water. So there are a lot of low flow options. So what we would do in a typical building is uh, we would go and look at all of these options where there can be water savings and we replace the entire thing with newer ones. Uh, it, it becomes a little bit difficult in, in certain residential buildings where they don't, you don't get access to, but uh, generally more than 60, 70, 80%, and depending on the, the type of the building we have, uh, uh, we are able to basically make a lot of these changes. Uh, the other problem in typical water savings is it's very difficult to predict because you do not know how much leakage is happening, right? So we always are conservative generally in terms of predicting it, but uh, uh, more often than not, leakages are a very integral part of building. Uh, it's difficult to quantify, but so we are always pleasantly surprised. And uh, so typically most water uh, retrofits uh, typically get paid back in, in two years to three years maximum. Uh, so, so we always say, like, you know, uh, toilets pay for boilers because boilers have a very long payback, right? So that's, I don't know if I answered that question. Uh, more questions? I guess not. Uh, so, uh, sir, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and giving us uh, so much no uh, knowledgeable stuff. And it's an honor to have you here on behalf of University of Waterloo and Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy. Uh, we would like thank you for everything. Thank you so much. Thank you.